Hello and welcome to the newest edition of the Wet Spotlight. This is a series where we take a species of fish and tell you everything there is to know about them. This time we're focusing on Corydoras similis, also known as the Violet Cory or Smudge Spot Corydoras. We'll be covering their natural habitat, their preferred water parameters, their diet, and much more. Grab your popcorn, settle in and enjoy as we discuss the congenial Corydoras similis. Corydoras similis is part of the order Siluriformes, the catfish, and is a member of the family Calichthyidae, the armored catfish, which also includes animals in the genera Dianema and Calichthys, to name a few. Corydoras is a combination of the word cori, meaning helmet, which refers to the large bony plates covering their heads, and doris, meaning cuirass which is a piece of armor that covers the body from neck to waist and refers to the additional bony plates that stretch along the sides of the fish. Similis is a Latin word meaning similar, which refers to Corydorus oristigma, a sympatric, look-alike species of Corydorus which shares a similar color palette to Similis. Corydorus similis in particular was first described by Hieronymus in 1991. Though it has been available in the aquarium hobby prior to its description, before that it was listed simply as Corydorus sp. violet. Did you know? Corydorus is a large and very diverse genus of catfish, with new species being discovered and described all the time. Organizing this diverse group of animals has become quite complicated, and to better simplify the process the C number and later on CW numbering systems were introduced. These systems are similar to the L number system used for identifying Plecostomus and other Loricarid species. C numbers were a system introduced in 1993 in the German aquarium magazine DOTS, which stands for Die Aquarien und Terrarien Zeitschrift, which is the same magazine that also introduced L numbers. This system was erected to better identify new species being brought into the hobby at the time because there were many, many different varieties that were being brought in before they could be scientifically described. UK hobbyist and Corydoras expert Ian Fuller further expanded upon this system by introducing CW numbers on his website Corydoras World in an attempt to pick up where dots left off and fill in prior gaps. Now, please do keep in mind that just because an animal has received an L number or a C number or a CW number, it does not necessarily mean that it will bear out to be a new and distinct species. It's simply a way for us hobbyists and enthusiasts to come up with an easy way to refer to these animals before they possibly do receive that new species marking. Here's where things get a little confusing. Within the family Calichthyidae, you have the subfamily Corydoratini, which contains four genera, sometimes regarded as three. Aspidorus, Brocus, which is now defunct, Corydorus, and Scleromystax. Before those four genera, the species are broken up even further into nine lineages. Lineage 1, the saddle snout Corydorus, which includes species such as the aforementioned Orostigma and one of my favorites, Corydorus fowleri. Lineage 2, Aspidorus, very small, sometimes referred to as toad quarries, wonderful little fish. Lineage 3, Scleromystax, including some of our favorites such as Scleromystax barbatus. Lineage 4, the dwarf species, including classics like Corydorus pygmaeus. Lineage 5, the elegans roop, which includes fish such as, well, stop me if this is surprising, but Corydorus elegans and a few others. Lineage 6, the true Corydorus, which includes old classics such as Corydorus paleotus. Lineage 7, the Aeneas group, which includes fish such as Corydorus Aeneas and Corydorus equis. Lineage 8, which is broken down even further into four subclades, the Brocus, so to speak, which includes species such as Splendens and Corydorus arcuatus. And Lineage 9, which includes a lot of hobby favorites, the classic short snouts. And these will include species such as Corydorus concolor, Corydorus hebrosus, Corydorus gossi, and frankly, it's all a little bit convoluted. There are several scientists that are working hard to get all of this figured out, and different genera may change in the future, and old names are resurrected as we continue to learn more about Corydorus. 
Of course, as it stands now, it is easy to refer to most of these fish all as Corydoras, and we'll leave it to the scientists to really hash things out. But of course, you can read more about this on websites such as Scott Cat or Planet Catfish for further reading. Like most other Corydoras in Lineage 9, this species is a medium-sized fish, with both sexes topping out at around 2 inches in length, although females will be a little bit more stout in the body. The head and torso of this species is a nice light orange with dark spots throughout the body, ending in a pronounced large smudge at the base of the tail at the caudal peduncle. The caudal peduncle itself has that aforementioned blotch which will stretch to the base of the caudal fin and it will darken the further down the body it goes. When kept well or in spawning condition, all of these traits become more exaggerated and the fish will turn a beautiful orange color with a lot of notes of purple on the spots and on that smudge. In nature, Corridor similis is native to the Rio Madeira Basin in the Brazilian state of Rondonia. They're found in all kinds of small tributaries, creeks, pools, and areas of flooded forest throughout that region. We reached out to German hobbyist and author Hans George Evers and inquired about his experience collecting this fish in the wild, and he told us this. I always found them in clearwater habitats, usually alongside Corridoris aura stigma, and sometimes Corridoris trilineatus. This species was very abundant with several color morphs depending on the populations. The water was 26 to 29 degrees Celsius, which is about 78 to 84 degrees Fahrenheit, with low conductivity and slightly acidic. In captivity, Corridor similis work in many different styles of aquaria. We found that they will thrive in biotypically accurate tanks with fine-grained river sand as well as driftwood and leaf litter, or even well-planted tanks with bright lighting and lots of extra cover. Although they do not necessarily need them, we found the green contrast does help that orange pop just a little bit more. We of course do recommend for this fish, as well as every species of Corydoras, that you avoid using pebbles or larger grain gravel, especially if it's coarse, as it can potentially pinch, scrape, or damage your Corydoras sensitive barbels which are a very important sensory organ and can unfortunately lead to bacterial infections if damaged. Any smaller and more docile community fish make for suitable tank mates for this animal, but if you want to keep in the Brazilian theme, we find the following species to be great additions to this tank. Ancestris claro, Epistogramma agassizi, or even Epistogramma elizabethae if you can find them, Carnegiella marthae, Copella natureri, Corridoris trilineatus, though do keep in mind these are in the same lineage and could potentially hybridize if you want to spawn them, and Hyphesobrycon herbert axelrodi would be good additions. We recommend keeping this species anywhere from a stable pH between 5.5 and 7.5, and at temperatures ranging anywhere, again, stably between 74 degrees and 84 degrees Fahrenheit. Violet Corridoras are exceedingly peaceful and well suited to many smaller community aquariums. Common sense is of courage when stalking, of course. If you think of a fish as too large, aggressive, or rambunctious for this animal, then it probably is. Like many Corridoras species, we do highly recommend keeping in these in conspecific groups of at least five to six individuals, although of course larger groups make for a more imposing visual, as well as more fish activity and confidence. Violet Corridoras have been bred many times in captivity and are spawned in a similar fashion to many other species in this lineage. In a well-established and well-cared-for tank, it's not uncommon for them to even spawn of their own accord, usually after a big water change. Typically, conditioning them well with frozen or plenty of live food and decreasing the temperature before raising it back up again can elicit spawning. For those wanting something a bit more precise, we'll be linking to a breeding report in the description below for those interested in taking up the challenge. We found that in captivity this species is not difficult to feed. They are mostly carnivores in the wild, feeding on primarily worms, insects, with some algal matter and vegetable matter mixed in. In captivity they'll eat almost anything offered, including hardy sinking pellets such as Saravipa chips or fluval bug bites. We do recommend, of course, giving them occasional frozen treats as well as occasional live feedings, if possible, of smaller insect larvae. And do know that you don't want to diet too heavy on the protein, as it can lead to issues such as Corydoras bubble disease. Likewise, although they're bottom dwellers, it's a common misconception that they'll really eat algae, 
and while wonderful animals, should not be purchased for its removal. If you're interested in obtaining some of these classy corridors of your own, check out our stock list at wetspottropicalfish.com and place an order today, or visit our store here in Portland in person. Whether you're a hobbyist looking for a gorgeous addition to the nether reaches of your tank, a new breeding project, or just a fish lover scratching that itch for knowledge, we hope you found what you needed in today's wet spotlight.